opened to welcome with embraced arms a center for Kutch, which is a minuscule part of India, but it has been given a very prominent space in this university. And with that thought in mind, I want to welcome the dignitaries here today. Samir sir, Amrita ma'am, our uh, chief guest, Dr. Faisal Devji, Honorary Secretary Jagbir sir, Deputy High Commissioner UK, our uh, Vice Chancellor Pillai sir, our Director of International Relations Satendra sir, Ukrande sir, Principal of Engineering, History Archives Pushpendra sir, Dean of Academics Himali ma'am, uh, the in Director in Charge Pallavi ma'am, uh, Dean of Education uh, Pooja ma'am, Experiential Learning Megha, Dr. Hemangi Bhagwat, Principal. I mean, the, the importance of this is that we are here, we have an interdisciplinary gathering here today. And I want to especially thank Dr. Ganesh Devi, who is the director of the School of Civilization, for leading us through this idea. And I want to tell um, everyone here that um, he is a, a people's person, loved by people, and that's the kind of work he's done for them. And uh, that's what we also hope to do here with the Center for Kutch. Um, I want to share something which says, Kuche me kadak kachi pani je kadake wari vij je varake jedi jyot jind jhan ji. This is actually an epigraph to a book. And as much as it is important to value classical languages, I think it's about time, and it's been time, a long time ago, that we respected these smaller, minor dialects coming from various regions of India and giving them that status. So um, I want to also say here today that I began this journey working on Kutch um, about 15 years ago. And um, every time I would go there and I would visit far-flung people from far-flung corners of Kutch. And I'm going to share a few couplets from the insights that I've got from there and how we want to go about working towards them. So uh, first of all, the prime reason why uh, we want to do this is uh, when I went to um, a village, um, I saw a woman in care-worn and half-worn chapels. Her cracked feet fit into the cracked earth. And she was standing right at a bus stop. And um, she couldn't read. She expected the signs to be like pictorial hieroglyphs. And she thought that if she could just understand what it is from what that is, she would know where this bus is going. And she was misled that this bus went to some other location instead of where it was supposed to go. So um, that is the question of education in Kutch. The ratio of education of women is to men and how much education they are receiving. So um, already the Sumaya group of institutes has set up two libraries in Kutch and the wish is that we have 100 in all. And uh, towards this, we have, the work has begun to set up a library in Kotedi and uh, the work will continue to go on. Our first batch of students from education department will be going to Kutch on 21st February to do a survey of this, and they will understand how these systems are working, how the students are responding to libraries, what is it that they need much more than this, and how they will, in a way, develop libraries of the future, which are actually the need of the time. The second aspect is about the dialect. It's a beautiful dialect. It's a monosyllabic dialect. I'll just give you a f one sentence from it, and it's actually a whole lot. So it says, no che, mi, me, pi, and everything is one word in itself. Sa, ro, lu, he, body, ke, cho, mu, so, do, di. So in these monosyllabic words, we have actually completed an entire conversation. This is the value of this language, which was used for trade. 
because they would sit in shallow water uh, boats across the ocean and they would exchange these uh, dialogues and they would sell their wares in this way. So trade is a very important aspect of Kachis. It's there in their genes, it's there in their blood to do this. And we want to address these aspects of Kach and empower them in, in the aspects and skills in which they are especially good at. I once went to a village where there were agarias working and they are salt gatherers. So they have a small house at the end of civilization, I would say. So sorry for my use of civilization here. <laughs> so, um, and what they would do is they would uh, sit there all day. What they had to do is they have a rake, which is called a salt rake, and they would just separate the salt out of it. Um, they had nothing creative in their life. They didn't have schools close to them. They didn't have green vegetables available to them. They had to walk for 17 kilometers to get at least one pow kilo of cluster beans. So we are talking about a land and a place and a location which is so far removed from things like this. And to them, I had a very lovely discussion with them. And uh, they had a lot of heaps of salt. So to them, I asked them, what can be flavor, grace, and beauty? Can it not be a rangoli? That why can't you make rangoli designs out of these heaps of salt outside your house? Because you're so good and you're so creative with it. So she said, I've never thought about it. You know, so the questions of aesthetics come much later in a life when you have your daily needs to meet. For us in a privileged background, it is quite easy to understand and think of some things like this. But uh, for a place like that, and I'm, I'm not generalizing, this is just one example of things. And uh, slowly like this, uh, we want to address each aspect. So, uh, and then and there is the thing of water, which is the biggest pressing question, whether Narmada will flow uphill in this, the uphill task of getting water to villages in Kutch. And uh, to that, there's Mongi, there's a term in Kachi, which means expensive. And that's also a name of a woman. So uh, to give it to you, Mongi Ben sells water, reaps kidney stone. So the water, portioned to a woman is sold to an industry and what she will get instead is kidney stone. It's just a couplet, but it says a lot about what's happening in Kutch. So, um, and what happens as an aftermath of this is that national revenue spikes and employment slumps. So um, it, is, it is about this land that we're talking about, which, is, which knows that abundance, not scarcity, is impervious. And when they have a lot of abundance is when they find it difficult to ascertain what to do. The situation of books and literature produced here is so dismal that uh, uh, a verse uh, su summarizes this, which says that books here are distributed, not sold. So you can understand the economy, the bookish economy. And um, I'll give you a last example from the Ran Utsav, which most of you will be very familiar with. You may have heard about it, which is the most famous aspect of Kutch. But the, the Ran Utsav came about after the earthquake. But uh, there are times when rain does fall. And um, the sealant, which was this Ran Utsav, which would seal the cracks of the economy of Kutch, is actually it leaks in unseasonal rain and wet house courts reclaim their place. What happens to a festival which has to run for four months and rain covers the run and you can't get in there? So, you know, there are these very regional specific, climate specific aspects, issues that is plaguing Kutch at times and at times it holds it all together. So um, I want to share that we have introduced eight courses, certificate courses, um, under the Center for Kutch. And Dr. Faisal Devji is on our part, on our board of studies. We have him. He's from the Oxford University. We, have, we had Kevin McGrath from Harvard University, and sadly, he's no more. So um, I'm just so glad that to this small initiative that we have here, we have experts from all over the world who have supported us. And he told me right yesterday that now whenever I go, I think about you and I want to share more people who are related to Kutch to you so that we can make this a more thriving space. So uh, 
that's one thing that we are going to have artist residency which is going to happen in april we are going to send a lot of students and this is most important to all the students here it has the emails have gone to your hods your faculty we are going to have we are going to gather a group of students intermittently who will go to kutch and this is going to be your chance to bring about real time change in your own lifetime in as uh, soon as you can possibly see so do attend lectures get to know more about kutch and do go to these visits to kutch to understand your uh, roots how native and real india is and if that inspires you to go and work in your own native place do it use this as an experience and learn from it um, with that i just like to end with um, uh, saying something about the kutchis which is they are rock solid they are characterized by an undercurrent of bedrock oldest conglomerate of basalt a tray of reliquy for ecology standing on pre-cambrian rocks full of faults that know what it is to rise so with this i want to end uh, the welcome address on kutch and i want to invite you to uh, share your insights to join us on this unique adventure as we voyage towards doing as much as we can for kutch thank you so much Thank you so much, Yamini. I'll request uh, the chief speaker for today's session, Professor Dr. Faisal Devji, to kindly come on the stage and uh, take his chair. Thank you, sir. I'll request uh, our honourable Vice Chancellor, sir, Professor Dr. Rajshekharan Pillai, to share a couple of words and address the audience. good morning and happy new year to each and every one first of all let me on behalf of the somaya vidyavihar university and the entire somaya vidyavihar family welcome professor faisal dev ji for this uh, somaya public lecture which has been happening in this uh, campus for the last 6 years since 2018 we are extremely glad that uh, the center for kutch studies has organized this meeting i don't want to make a speech everything is said about the, uh, the about the public lecture and also i let me congratulate the center for kutch studies center for himalayan studies which are part of the school of civilization and this is this, their first activity i see large number of students before me it's a very good sign and i would, uh, I would like to make use of this lecture in a very significant way let me congratulate and appreciate the efforts taken by our management mr samir somaiya particularly for uh, for bringing out activities unconventional in the university uh, he will just he, he it is all his ideas and of course we are definitely trying to translate into action and the actions are also happening i am really glad about it uh, i don't want to make a speech Uh, this uh, this university or somaya vidyavihar has been in education since for the for the last eight decades today morning just 10 minutes we had breakfast together in my room uh, uh, of course i had a small interaction he was uh, remembering his visit to mahatma gandhi university at kottayam which which i presided for uh, as vice chancellor uh, his ideas on, of course this topic is also very relevant gandhi and the sea maybe he will be talking about the his uh, gandhi's simplicity and his way of uh, the vastness vastness of sea and the interconnectedness of sea is can be seen in gandhi's philosophy probably you will be touching upon all these things let me welcome him thank him for accepting our invitation let me welcome all of you and uh, let let us let us enjoy the lecture thank you very much thank you sir I'll request uh, Honorable Vice Chancellor, sir, and uh, Chancellor of a University, to kindly come and felicitate our guest, Professor Dr. Faisal Devji. Mm -hmm. 
This is a stole or shawl made by our students at Somaya Kala Vidya Vihar, which Chancellor Sir is presenting it to our guest. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Today, we also have in our presence uh, the British. No, no, we want to eat on that. British Deputy High Commissioner Harjinder Kang, sir, and Rashi Jain, madam, Director of British Council. So, we welcome you as well. Now, without much delay, uh, we have been all eagerly waiting for Professor Dr. Faisal Devji to speak so that we can be immersed in uh, the ideas that he is here to share with us. So I'll request our uh, speaker, Dr. Faisal Devji. Dr. Faisal Devji is a distinguished scholar and professor of Indian history at Oxford University. He also serves as the director of the Asian Studies Center at Oxford University. Holding a PhD in intellectual history from the University of Chicago, he has a rich academic background, having been a junior fellow at the Harvard Society of Fellows and later overseeing the graduate program at the Institute of Ismaili Studies in London. After teaching at the Yale and the New School for Social Research, he joined Oxford University in 2009 as a reader in modern South Asian history. Dr. Devji's interests span the intellectual history and political thought of modern South Asia, with particular focus on the cultural and philosophical aspects of violence and the emergence of nonviolence as a political project. His work also delves into global dimensions of Islam, exploring its evolution as a category. His recent research exposes the themes such as the notion of humanity in the context of globalization, efforts to transcend the nation state and the influence of anarchism in the post-colonial world. He has been widely published and there are numerous books, just to name a few, The Muslim Zion, The Impossible Indian Gandhi and The Temptation of Violence, Terrorist in Search of Humanity, Militant Islam and Global Politics, just to name a few of them. I'll request Professor Devji to kindly take the stage and address us. Thank you. Thank you very much. It is a, a pleasure and a privilege to be here addressing you all today. I want to express my gratitude and thanks uh, to the Chancellor, Sri Samir Somaya, uh, to the Vice Chancellor, Professor Pillay, uh, and to Dr. Yamini Dansha, the Director of the Center for Cut Studies. Uh, I can't help thinking that one of the reasons I was invited uh, was because I myself am Kachi, uh, but that is to a privilege. Um, now, what I want to do today is to talk about uh, Gandhi between land and sea. As father of the nation, we tend to think of Gandhi as a territorial figure. He is, after all, the man who freed this country. This country is understood as the sum of its territorial parts. And yet, we all know that he was also an imperial figure, an international figure, and a global figure in his own day and not just confined to the territory of the land that would come to be the Republic of India. Now, India, as I'm sure you all know, was in colonial times part of a great maritime empire. Uh, it could not be dissociated from this empire, which was a, one connected by sea routes and sea lanes. And so when Gandhi thought about and acted in the interests of freedom, he had to do so not only with regards to India's territory, 
but with regards to the maritime empire within which it existed. We also know how India was important to this empire in its enormous extent. Uh, it supplied the empire with raw materials, it supplied it with goods, it supplied it with labor, and it supplied it with troops to secure large parts of the British domain. In, by the time we get to the First World War, Indians were fighting in Europe itself. Uh, and so you cannot think of this enormous empire without India's contribution forced, though it may have been to it. And so Gandhi's struggle for freedom had to be an imperial struggle in addition to an Indian one. It had to be an international struggle, and it had indeed to be a global one. Now, the imperial order, just as the international order that followed it, was defined by a relationship between land and sea. The land was the realm of particularity, of sovereignty. India, of course, was not sovereign, but it represented British sovereignty. And sovereignty was about stressing the particularity and the specificity of laws and customs and rules and regulations in a particular place. That's one aspect. The other aspect, which is the maritime one, uh, is about universality. So if land represents the particular and the specific, which is what allowed the British to treat India differently from Britain itself, because it was the specificity of India that defined its rule, the sea represented the universal aspect of imperialism. And you see this very clearly already in the days of the East India Company, and certainly once the empire gets established after the mutiny of 1857. The sea and the maritime routes that secure and define the British Empire are defined in terms of free trade, the freedom of movement, the freedom of ideas, the freedom of action, just as the international order that followed imperialism would do. And the land is defined by the particular and by the specific. While nationalists in Gandhi's day wanted either to stress the particularity of India, to rip it out of this set of interconnections and communications and focus on its sovereignty, they did so on the one hand. On the other hand, and somewhat contradictorily, they also were interested in the internationalization of India and in the freedom of peoples around the world. So the question often was, should we attend to India's particularity and claim our sovereignty over it? Or should we also, or alternatively, think about rendering India an equal part of the empire, just like England itself? So when you read a text like Nehru's The Discovery of India, at some point in that book, he talks about the two Englands. There's the England of liberalism and freedom and John Stuart Mill, and then there's the England which is a brutal colonial power. And what Nehru suggests is that India, like any other colonized country, has the duty to keep England true to her better self, the self of liberalism and freedom and John Stuart Mill. He thought it was possible for this to happen. And in doing so, of course, he subscribed to the internationalist universal vision uh, defined uh, by maritime supremacy. Gandhi, on the other hand, thought there were not two Englands but one, because he understood that the England of freedom and liberty depended upon the England of colonial oppression and vice versa, that you could not have one without the other, that the universality of the British Empire, its claims to universality, were predicated upon the particularity and the specificity of the colony. He therefore had to think about another way in which to relate the particularity of the land and the universality of the sea. 
Now, the empire's universality, this maritime empire and its universality, was nevertheless premised upon a kind of weakness, an interesting weakness. Because unlike former empires, the empires of the pre-modern past, which were territorial, they started in one place and they expanded over territory and they tended to be unified territorially. The modern European empires, like the Dutch and the English, but also, of course, the French, the Portuguese and the Spanish, were disconnected precisely because they were maritime empires. Uh, that you could have an empire which was separated one part from the other by various uh, sea lanes, by oceans, uh, by, by the territories of other empires. And this made it very difficult, if not impossible, to think of it, to think of any of these empires as in, as representing any kind of integrity at all. After all, not only were they dispersed in the case of the British Empire across the surface of the globe, but they also um, contained a plethora of religions, cultures, languages, ethnicities, etc. This is true of all empires, but in the case of the British or the Dutch Empire, it prevented, it not only prevented any effort at homogenization, unlike, say, the Roman Empire, uh, but it also served to augment the distinction between the universal and the particular that I started out by describing. The logical incoherence, the territorial incoherence of the British Empire meant that it focused on very small bits that were choke points. The Suez Canal, the Straits of Hormuz, uh, the Straits of Gibraltar, uh, the English Channel itself, and many more that you can think of. Because these were the links, the very delicate links, that allowed the British to transfer troops and personnel and specie and goods from one part of their empire to the other. And so even though the empire was vast in its extent, it really depended upon these very small bits, often waterways, uh, for uh, its continued existence. But its vast and dispersed form, as I suggested, also meant that it was impossible to think of it as an integrity of any sort. And this allowed the British precisely to make universalist claims. So rather than speaking in the name of the empire as a territory of any kind, they spoke of it in terms of humanity itself that the British Empire was there to advance the cause of humanity. And its acts were humanitarian acts by definition. We see this happening already in the 18th and early 19th centuries with the abolition of slavery. Britain, of course, abolished slavery. Uh, and it abolished slavery in such a way as to make clear that it would impound slave cargo even on non-British vessels in international waters when the Royal Navy came ac across such shipping. Right? So it broke what then went by the name of international law precisely because the abolition of slavery was seen as a humanitarian enterprise and Britain or its empire spoke in the name of humanity itself. This way of thinking about the empire and its mission in terms of humanity, in global terms, in universal terms, was very likely made possible by the fact that it was so dispersed and incoherent territorially. You could not define it in any other way. And that meant that particularity and specificity, the reason why India was treated differently from England, for instance, came to be understood as a gift from the universality of the empire to its subjects, who were, for various reasons, understood as being non-universal and therefore confined to their own specificities and particularities. Now, Gandhi, I think, struggles with this relationship of land to sea, of particular to universal, throughout his career. And what I want to do today is to describe some of the ways he does so in his voyages to London, first as a student in 1888, 
to South Africa as a young lawyer in 1893, back to India in 1914, and then he takes one last set of voyages to the Round Table Conference in London in the early 1930s, and this is a poster uh, of Gandhi uh, returning from the Round Table Conferences in London, and you can see the sea is very prominent in it. He's getting off from the ship, and he's being greeted by a Desh Sevika. Um, not Mother India, but interesting figure, uh, Desh Sevika, and the Congress flag there. Uh, so he's literally bringing, if you will, the universal back uh, to India, uh, having transformed it in the process. So with those few introductory words, I'd like to begin by saying something about uh, Gujarat in Gandhi's days. Uh, so Gujarat, in a way, like a miniature, miniaturized version of the British Empire itself, was a place which had no territorial integrity. It was part of Bombay presidency. It was pockmarked by hundreds of princely states. And it had extensive trade diasporas across the Western and Eastern Indian Oceans. Which is why, when Gandhi couldn't find a job as a lawyer in Bombay, as it then was known, he didn't decide to go to Calcutta or Madras, as they, these cities were then known, but to South Africa. Because in some ways, South Africa was more closely linked to Gujarat than Bengal or any other part of India. So Gujarat was territorially incoherent in some sense, and yet at the same time universal, as if it were a miniature of the empire itself on the other. Uh, that the trade routes that had shaped Gujarat and that Gujarat itself shaped across the oceans took Gandhi to Durban and Johannesburg. Now, the fact that Gujarat didn't exist as a territorial unit and that India itself was simply seen as a particularity in, this, in the vastness of a maritime empire meant, I suspect, that for a long time, forms of Indian resistance to colonialism uh, occurred in quite narrow and corporeal ways. They had to do with the body, not with territory as such. And these included issues such as uh, eating, a very simple act that we all do, food, became an enormous political, uh, assumed an enormous political meaning. Think only of the mutiny of 1857. Uh, as I'm sure you all know, it was, or it was said to be inspired by the fact that Hindu and Muslim soldiers in the East India Company's army refused to bite the bullet cartridges that they thought were greased with cow and pig fat, because this would break their caste and their religion. Uh, there were other complaints that inspired the mutineers as well, including apparent attempts at forcible conversion of Hindus and Muslims, as well as intermarriages which led to conversion. These are all bodily matters. These are all issues which have to do with very ordinary but therefore deeply profound issues. We all have to eat. We interact with one another. We marry and have sexual rela marital relations. Um, so resistance and protest often took these kinds of forms with India's colonization. Um, and it's possible to say, perhaps, that Gandhi, for the first time since 1857, politicized eating in a major way, through his fasts, of course. In this case, it was the refusal to eat. Just as the soldiers had refused to bite those cartridges, his refusal to eat, his fasting, politicized diet in a way that hadn't happened since the days of 1857. But in his early life, Gandhi uh, had to struggle with these matters. Uh, he had a friend. Uh, let's see if I can get his picture up. This is not changing. If you could. He had a friend called Sheikh Mehtab in Gujarat. 
as a young boy. Yes. Oh. And Sheikh Mehtab told the young Gandhi that the reason we are colonized uh, is because of our diet. We tend to be vegetarians and the British eat meat and that's why they're big and strong. And so in order uh, to compete with the British, we too need to be like them. And in his autobiography, so there is the young Gandhi uh, on the left and Sheikh Mehtab on the right. Uh, and in order to compete with them, we need to alter our diet. So this is, oh yeah. so this is another uh, perhaps peculiar and small example of what I'm calling the politics of eating. Uh, and Gandhi in his autobiography quotes a doggerel verse by the Gujarati poet Narmad, uh, which he translates as follows. Behold the mighty Englishman, his ru he rules the Indian small because being a meat eater, he is five cubits tall. Uh, and Gandhi experiments with eating meat. And I, I'm sure you know the story. He goes to bed and he, he, he hears the goat bleating from his stomach and it horrifies him so much uh, that he stops doing so. Now, this way of thinking that Sheikh Mahathab recommends ends up being the way that a great many revolutionary nationalists thought as well. So by the time you get to 1909 and Gandhi writes Hind Swaraj, he's on a ship, he's again on the seas uh, between London and South Africa. Uh, Hind Swaraj is constructed as a dialogue between an editor who speaks for Gandhi and a reader who is a revolutionary nationalist who wants to free India by violent means. Uh, it's the same logic as Sheikh Mehtab's logic. How do we compete with them? We must become like them. And Gandhi's response to Sheikh Mehtab eventually, and then in Hind Suraj is also the same. He says, but then we shall simply have English rule without the Englishman. What is the point of that? India has something greater to offer, her own people and the world. Uh, competing with your rulers to become like them is no way to achieve freedom. It is a way of becoming further colonized. So how then is it possible to think about freedom in an alternative fashion? When Gandhi proceeds to London as a student of the law, this politics of diet and uh, sexual relations uh, is also uppermost in his mind. He tells us that he takes his own food onto the ship. You can imagine there are kakras and various kinds of things of that nature, uh, which Gujaratis make so well. Uh, and he's hesitant to eat at the ship table. He asks for certificates from English passengers on the ship to confirm that he has in fact been vegetarian because of course, before Gandhi embarks on his voyage, he has been outcasted by his caste, all right? He has been told you cannot go abroad because you cannot maintain your integrity as a Hindu, indeed as an Indian. When you travel abroad, you are forced to eat food that, of, of, you know, whose provenance you know very little about. You interact with all kinds of people. You might end up with having sexual liaisons in an inappropriate and immoral way, and therefore it's best not to leave. Quite apart from the fact that Banyas Gandhi's caste were not meant to leave anyway. Brahmins and Banyas are meant to stay. Only Kshatriyas and Shudras can leave. Uh, so uh, Gandhi does all of this stuff, and he has, but he has made a vow to his mother that he shall not engage in immoral or prescribed activities. And for, a, for many years, the vow is the only thing that holds him he has no other way of reasoning why he's not eating meat because he's bombarded uh, by advice much more sophisticated than Sheikh Mehtab's advice that you live in a cold climate now, you have to eat meat. Uh, you are at the heart of empire, you have to mix with everyone. Uh, why is intermarriage a, such a bad thing? Uh, why should men and women not mix as they do in England? And Gandhi is hard-pressed to justify his refusal 
to do so, though he's sorely tempted on several occasions. And he only fixes on this vow. He had made a promise to his mother, and that's why he couldn't do it. Eventually, he comes up with the whole theory of the vow, that the vow is a way of breaking the connections, the interrelations, the communications that define the maritime empire itself and its universality. Not in order to claim the particular for himself, but in order to break the chain of cause and effect that in some other context you might call the karmic chain of cause and effect. Right? How do you escape the logic of karma? Initially in a groundless way, the promise made to his mother. Later on, he understands why he has done it. And he says in his autobiography, for me, the question of diet was not one to be determined on the authority of the Shastras. It was one interwoven with my course of life, which is guided by principles no longer depending upon outside authority. I had no desire to live at the cost of them. Uh, which is not to say he disregarded the Shastras, but he had internalized them. Uh, Again, an apparently innocuous and minor example, but I think one that speaks to the larger theme I hope to be broaching here, which is the relationship of universal in particular, land and sea. So in all these ways, Gandhi seems to be a partisan initially of the particular, the refusal to interdine or to eat prescribed foods. Uh, soon we shall see the refusal to interact with the opposite sex in in ways that were considered immoral. Uh, eventually, the refusal even to communicate in certain ways. But I think something far more uh, important is going on here. And I already said something about the importance of the vow and the breaking, the way it breaks the chain of cause and effect uh, that defines the karmic cycle and allows for an opening. And that opening is an opening for freedom. Let me turn to his experiments. So I've said something about his problems with and his experiments with diet. He spends a lot of time in London trying to find vegetarian restaurants. He experiments with food and all the rest. But sexual relations are also uh, important in this respect. And remember, both eating and sexuality are part of the kind of bodily nature of resistance in this period. And such relations uh, are also connected to the sea, which is meant to be an area of mixing of openness and of freedom. So here is Gandhi describing one of his four temptations uh, by women uh, when he goes to Portsmouth for a vegetarian conference in 1890. He says, during the last year, as far as I can remember, of my stay in England, that is in 1890, there was a vegetarian conference at Portsmouth to which an Indian friend and I were invited. Portsmouth is a seaport with a large naval population. It has many houses with women of ill fame, women who not actually prostitutes, uh, who while not actually prostitutes are at the same time not very scrupulous about their morals. We returned from the conference in the evening. After dinner, we sat down to play a rubber of bridge in which our landlady joined, as is customary in England, even in respectable households. Every player indulges in innocent jokes as a matter of course, but here my companion and our hostess began to make indecent ones as well. I did not know that my friend was an adept in the art. It captured me. Uh, and I also joined in. Just when I was about to go beyond the limit, leaving the cards and the game to themselves, God, through the good companion, uttered the blessed warning. When's this devil in you, my boy? Be off, quick. I was ashamed. I took the warning and expressed within myself a gratefulness to my friend. Remembering the vow I had taken before my mother, again the vow comes back, I fled from the scene. To my room I went quaking, trembling, and with a beating heart, like quarry, escaped from its pursuer. So here too, as with his experiments as a young man with diet and food and what to eat and what not to eat, Gandhi is refusing certain kinds of connections. He does so again because of the vow he makes his mother, but there's something different. Here we see for the first time the mention of providence. God has saved him. 
in the case of eating, it was his dharma, his duty to his mother because of the vow he had made his mother that saves him and that therefore breaks this connection of cause and effect. With immoral relations of a sexual nature, it is God himself who comes to Gandhi's aid. And this too is a way of thinking about the breaking of the chain. Uh, because when God comes to your help, the chain of cause and effect has been shattered. Uh, and Gandhi, through his career, often spoke of the way in which, at moments of great difficulty, it wasn't any of us, he or others, who actually made things happen, but a kind of break that allowed for what he called the incarnation of God on Earth. Um, so Gandhi, of course, is a deeply religious man, but you can understand his words in a purely philosophical way as well. Uh, he speaks at more than one level. Uh, so his idea about uh, the break for God to enter, the incarnation of God on earth, can be seen as a deeply religious understanding of human action, but also as a way of, as a way of grasping the limitations of our acts and their intentions. That we may intend to do something and cause that thing to happen, but in fact we have little or no control over the consequences even of our successful acts. Uh, and it is because we have no control over these consequences uh, that uh, our own acts moving from beyond our control become opportunities not only for our defeat, but for the victory of God himself, right? uh, for providence, the very providence that interferes uh, to save Gandhi. Now, in all of these ways, Gandhi, as I suggested earlier, seems to be a partisan for a very traditional and orthodox interpretation of what it is to be an Indian or a Hindu or a moral person generally, all right? You don't do this, you don't do that, you keep, uh, you keep to your dietary restrictions, you keep to your moral virtues, uh, uh, and you don't consider the universal. But in fact, what he's doing, and what he will do much more explicitly eventually, is to question humanity itself as the form that universality, universality took in the empire. Um, so here is a picture of the Kildonan Castle, which is the ship that Gandhi was on when he wrote in Swaraj. He wrote it in the, uh, in the course of uh, a few days, initially writing with his right hand, and then when his right hand tired with his left hand because he had trained himself to write with both hands. And it was his first great work, this tract, in Swaraj. Already in Hin Swaraj, he has become a critic of the kind of universality represented by the humanitarian claims of the empire. Right. He argues that the way in which we think about humanity, which is to say biologically, in terms precisely of eating, interdining, human beings are those who eat together, of sexuality because they intermarry, of speech, because they can communicate with each other. These are all bodily comportments. These are all biologically defined ways of understanding what it is to be human. And some have a very long philosophical pedigree. You go back to Aristotle, man is the speaking animal. Uh, but for Gandhi, they are also, or they also represent the same logic that defines racism. Racism is also understood biologically. It's also understood uh, as being uh, sequestered in terms of who you can marry, whom you can eat with, caste as well, uh, 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 whom you should or can speak with, your language as opposed to someone else's language. Uh, and though the definition of humanity in biological terms might claim to be universal and that of race might claim to be particular, 
For Gandhi, the problem was that they shared the same language and they shared the same logic and reasoning. And this was unacceptable. So he moves on from anguishing about these very small matters, apparently small matters like diet and sexuality, to thinking about them and thinking about the body in these larger terms by criticizing the role they play in the universalist enterprise of humanity. So for instance, he argues uh, that intermarriage, that uh, inter, whether it is interdining or intermarriage uh, uh, or communication, these things, while worthy, uh, cannot define what it is to be human. Uh, and that to pretend that they do is to fall into a logic that characterizes racial identification, uh, even if your aim is universal. And let me give you a couple of examples uh, of this. Uh, in Gandhi's day, as in our own, uh, there were a number of controversies which had to do precisely with eating and with marriage and with communication. Uh, cow protection and cow slaughter is one. Uh, conversion is another, religious conversion is another, and caste interdining among castes is a third. These continue to be issues in India today. And Gandhi's uh, involvement in rethinking these issues is really startlingly original in my view, and yet highly ambiguous in another way. Uh, so on the one hand, as I said, he tries to displace intermarriage and interdining as grounds for linking people one with the other. Because he thinks that these biological grounds are dubious by definition. Um, he's also critical of conversion, not because he refuses the right of people to change their religion, but because he thinks that the process of conversion is vitiated and betrayed by the communication that is required for it, by the preaching that is required for it, that he argues depends upon castigating and putting down the religion that is meant to be repudiated for the religion uh, that is meant to be embraced. And he often tells missionaries from all sides, Hindu as well as Christian or Muslim, that uh, you must not speak, you must not communicate, you must just live your faith in the best way possible. And once you do this, you will attract people of their own accord. You will not coerce them. Uh, that language is coercive by definition. Uh, and if you act your faith, then you're actually offering an invitation of a real kind. Um, and he doesn't mind people converting uh, in that way. So already in his intervention on a very controversial topic like conversion, uh, he has criticized speech and communication, which is meant to be an essential part of the definition of the human. Over the issue of cow slaughter, he's very interesting. Uh, I, I won't go into the details of his thoughts on it, uh, but just to say that one of the things that Gandhi is interested in when he thinks about non-human life is that he thinks that we have a duty towards all life, including non-human life, that does not depend on interdining, intermarriage, and communication. Your relationship, whether it is to a cow or to any other animal, cannot, of course, be dependent on such things. You don't interdine or intermarry or uh, communicate with a cow. And it is precisely for this reason that your duty towards her is unilateral. It is your dharmic duty. It doesn't matter what the cow wants or does not want. Uh, and it represents for Gandhi a more fruitful vision of what human relations too can be like. 
that they should not be dependent on prior agreement, that they are unilateral. We owe our neighbors, we have a duty towards our neighbors, whether or not we eat with them or we intermarry with them or we dine with them. Uh, and the model for this relationship, this moral relationship is actually uh, that of human beings with non-human life. So again, notice the, you may agree with it or not, but notice the originality of the move that Gandhi is making. In making this claim, he's saying, we have thought about humanity in two narrow terms. If we think about relations between species, what do we gain? Well, what we gain is we put into question the very things that define human relations, that we think define human relations, that we communicate with each other, that we intermarry with one another, uh, and that we interdine with one another. But Gandhi goes on to point out in great detail that all of these three aspects that generally define humanity can also be deeply violent. Marriage is, uh, was and perhaps often continues to be unequal. Uh, and uh, f uh, you know that sexual relations are often hierarchical and violent. Interdining too is not necessarily uh, a, a happy coming together. Uh, and language is as much used to denigrate and to put down and to dehumanize our fellow human beings as it is used uh, to communicate with them uh, and to create community with them. So these are all double-edged uh, forms. These are all double-edged instruments. And what Gandhi is doing is trying to allow us to see their ambiguity by expanding the remit of thinking about what it means to be human beyond the universality, the, the kind of maritime universality of the human that the empire encourages. Now, let me move from these concerns with diet and sexuality, which characterized Gandhi's first travel abroad to London, uh, to his trip to South Africa, right? So while his voyage to London had allowed Gandhi to rediscover uh, India outside the relationship of universal in particular that defined uh, an imperial logic by thinking about the wow, by thinking about duty, uh, by thinking about these things, his journey to South Africa permitted him to question what being Indian itself was all about. Because when he arrives in Durban, he sees a kind of Gulliver's, you know, Gulliver's travel where you have uh, uh, Gulliver first in the land of the giants and then in the land of uh, you know, big people and small people, where things are reversed. Uh, he discovers a world of topsy-turvy relations in which the more Indian identities is emphasized, the more tenuous and weaker it becomes. And he comes to the understanding that identity itself is politically insufficient. So let me read you a passage. In the course of these two or three days, when he first arrives in South Africa, I could see that the Indians were divided into different groups. One was that of Muslim merchants, who would call themselves Arabs. Another was that of Hindu, and yet another of Parsi clerks. The Hindu clerks were neither here nor there, unless they cast in their lot with the Arabs. The Parsi clerks would call themselves Persians. These three classes had some social relations with one another. But by far the largest class was that of composed of Tamil, Telugu, and North Indian indentured and freed laborers, right? So on the one hand, it's a topsy-turvy world because it's a world in which the richest class are Muslims, Gujarati Muslims like Gandhi, and they are the ones who employ him to come to South Africa. Uh, and the Muslims and the Parsis and others describe themselves in different ways because for them to be called an Indian is uh, insulting. It's, it's seen as insulting for, uh, in, in a place like South Africa. And he describes to us all of these uh, ways in which Indians try to counter white uh, contempt. Uh, you know, um, one of the, the two f famous words of contempt, one is coolie, which we know what that is, and it refers to natured laborers, but of course all Indians are called coolies. And the other is Sami, 
which also refers to indentured laborers, but comes from a, 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 a distorted version of a southern Indian surname with Swami, right? Uh, and often Gandhi tells us Indians who are called Sami would respond by saying, well, but don't you know Swami means master? So are you saying I'm your master? And then sometimes the, the person uh, you know, whom they said this to would be ashamed, and other times he would respond violently. But in all cases, Gandhi arrives in South Africa to find all of these Indian groups. They're living together. They don't quarrel with one another. He tells us that the upper caste groups, whether they're Parsi or Hindu or Muslim, have social relations with one another, but they don't really have social relations with the lower caste indentured laborers. So this is a society in which it is caste and class, not religion, that defines um, division. All right. uh, and he starts to think about what does it mean to be Indian in this context. He asks the Indian merchants whom he works for why they put up with these insults. And they say to him, and using a phrase that Gandhi then goes on to repeat several times, well, we pocket insults as we pocket their money. We pocket their insults as we pocket their money. So these are banya to banya conversations where they're saying, well, we're here to make money one of the conditions of making money is that we have to bear these insults. All right? So it's in our self-interest to tolerate these insults. Of course, they become intolerable, which is why Gandhi is brought to South Africa in the first place, though he's brought there to mediate between two Maimon families. He's not brought there to fight the government. All right? He does so eventually. Now, Gandhi takes from this phrase, which he uses, as I said several times himself, the idea that Self-interest, rather than being something we should want for ourselves to achieve our freedom, as the revolutionary nationalists suggested, is something that actually contributed to our enslavement. Right. And in Hind Suraj, he says this. The British conquered us because we wanted them here. Because of our self-interest, we wanted their goods, we wanted these industrial products that were cheap, uh, and we liked the way they dealt with us, and therefore they are here with us. So it is not that we lack self-interest. It is not our loss of self-interest that has allowed for our colonization, but the reverse. The fact that we are self-interested has made us into colonial subjects. So self-interest cannot define any urge for freedom or struggle for freedom. That must, of course, be sacrifice sacrifice and struggle. And a nation can only be created through sacrifice and through mutual forms of sacrifice and not through self-interest. Because self-interest is capable of breaking down any society rather than building it up. Because it can be infinitely subdivided. Right. Now, in his early days in South Africa, Gandhi too, like the Indians he meets there, is interested in stressing his identity his particularistic identity, the kind of particularism that the British have confined to India and defined India as being particularistic. So there's a, a set of battles in the courts where he wants to wear a turban because he thinks that you know, Indians are not allowed to wear headgear. Uh, and so he gets what he calls a Beng Bengali pagri to put on his head, which can be removed. And there's a big struggle. He's refused entry into the court and all the rest, even though he's of course, an accredited lawyer from the Inner Temple in London. But he realizes that this form of identity, which is about self-interest as well, really does not work. Um, and he realizes that when he returns to South Africa from a trip to India in 1896. Now, when he returns, he does the following. This is Gandhi's family photograph taken in Bombay before they returned to South Africa on this trip in 1896. He says, I therefore determined the style of dress for my wife and children. How could I like them to be known as Katyawar Banias? The Parsis used then to be regarded as the most civilized people among Indians. And so when the complete European style seemed to be unsuited, we adopted the Parsi style. Accordingly, my wife wore the Parsi sari and the boys the Parsi coat and trousers. Of course, no one could be without shoes and stockings. It was long before my wife and children could get used to them. 
The shoes cramped their feet and the stockings stank with perspiration. The toes often got sore. Here, and you can see they look rather glum. Uh, you know, here are Gandhi's wife and children in their semi-Parsi uh, accoutrement. Uh, so he too is trying to play an identity in various ways in South Africa. He takes them back in order to, like, how do we refashion our identity in such a way uh, as to not be insulted for it? Well, we need to look more civilized. We need to wear shoes and stockings and these sort of partial Western clothes. Uh, but when he arrives in Durban, uh, he meets uh, uh, the second or third major uh, instance of violence in his time there. Because when Gandhi had been in India, he had made comments that were ca carried by Reuters uh, about uh, racial discrimination in South Africa. Uh, so let me read you what Gandhi says. As soon as we landed, some youngsters recognized me and shouted, Gandhi, Gandhi. About half a dozen men rushed to the spot and joined in the shouting. Mr. Lawton, he's there with his friend, Mr. Lawton, who's also a lawyer, feared that the crowd might swell and hail the rickshaw. I had never liked the idea of being in a rickshaw. This was to be my first experience, but the youngsters would not let me get into it. They frightened the rickshaw boy out of his life, and he took to his heels. As we went ahead, the crowd continued to swell until it became impossible to proceed further. They first caught hold of Mr. Lawton and separated us. Then they pelted me with stones, brick bats, and rotten eggs. Someone snatched away my turban, that famous Bengali pagri. Uh, whilst others began to batter and kick me, I fainted and caught hold of the front railings of a house and stood there to get my breath, but it was impossible. They came upon me boxing and battering. The wife of the police superintendent who knew me happened to be passing by. The brave lady came up, opened the, her parasol, though there was no sun then, and stood between the crowd and me. Now, there's something uh, quite remarkable about this passage. There are two moments in it which are interesting. One is the mention of the rickshaw. Right? So here is Gandhi telling us how he's being attacked. Right? But he pauses the narrative at two points. At one point, he says, I never wanted to ride in a rickshaw in the first place. It's almost as if I'm really glad that the rickshaw wala ran away. Now, it's a curious thing to do in an account of an attack, to pause it. The second pause is when he mentions the wife of the police superintendent, the white police superintendent, who opens her parasol to shield Gandhi because they will not attack her. And Gandhi says, though there was no sun then, again, a strange locution, a strange use of words, because it's clear from the context that this is not about sun or rain. You know, it's clear that she's opened a parasol to protect Gandhi. But here, too, he has paused. And I, this you see happening throughout his work. And it is another example of the kind of breaking of the chain of cause and effect that I described earlier. All right? Where what Gandhi does is to break the narrative itself so as to allow you to exit from it, so as to allow for a kind of gap where freedom can become possible, that it allows you to think differently. Uh, the pauses work in the same way as the vow, the oath, or the promise to his mother, uh, or God's providence in saving him from temptation did. They break things, all right? They break the chain that unites the universal with the particular and the sea with the land. So what happens next? Gandhi is taken to a safe place, and then he tells us, as suggested by the superintendent, I put on an Indian constable's uniform and wore on my head a Madrasi scarf wrapped around a plate to serve as helmet. Two detectives accompanied me, one of them disguised as an Indian merchant and with his face painted to resemble that of an Indian. Now, this is almost like burlesque. You know, can you imagine God? He puts a plate, he wraps a cloth around it, and pretends to be a madrasi, and the policemen black their faces up to pretend to be Indians. It's like a piece of theater. Uh, and I think in all these ways, Gandhi's coming to the denouement of his argument about identity by saying, in fact, these forms of identity are absurd. What does it matter if my wife and children are dressed like this, if I'm wearing a Bengali pagri? My Bengali pagri is being knocked off, and now I have to wear a plate. 
you know, with a cloth around it to pretend to be someone else, that these forms of identity are, um, uh, cannot bear the weight of freedom, uh, that they're unable to actually help Indians either to avoid the insults that they were getting by saying, don't you know what Sami means, uh, nor do they allow enough grounding for a larger struggle. Uh, instead, it is mutual acts of sacrifice that create solidarity. Now, Gandhi learns in this way to play upon the universal without identifying with it. So here, in all of these ways, he rehearses and then goes on to reject the particularity and the specificity, which is meant to mark colonized subjects. Right? The most they can do is try to play with it a bit, like he tries to do with his family. Dresses them a bit differently, so they don't get insulted and look bad as Katyawar Baniyas. Right? He, he comes to realize on that trip back, when he's attacked in Durban, that this is insufficient. Uh, it is okay for Indians of all varieties to have their, of course, they should have their languages, their customs, their dress, uh, uh, their practices. That is not the point. The point is how do you create solidarities between these groups? It is not just a super identity that will do it, which is what he was trying to do here, right? And what he was trying to do when donning the, what, the Bengali pugri to modernize Indian identity and to create a kind of generic Indian Particular identities should remain, but it is the act of mutual solidarity and sacrifice that makes struggle and freedom possible. And he pushes this logic against itself. Let me give you a couple of examples, which are often ignored by historians because they, make, they, they think they make Gandhi look bad. Right? So you know in South Africa, Gandhi, both in the Boer War and in the Zulu Wars, volunteers to lead an ambulance corps of Indians, right? uh, supposedly with the British, though in both wars he was in fact anti-British. He supported the Boers and he supported the Zulus. And yet he worked with the British Army, uh, but in such a way as to care for the wounded of both sides, blacks and whites, Boers and English. In 1914, when he's in England, the First World War breaks out, and Gandhi thinks to himself, what am I to do? Uh, if I simply live here and don't participate in fighting, I'm still benefiting from this war because I'm being protected by the Royal Navy and my food supply is being guaranteed by the Royal Navy, so I'm a beneficiary of violence. So what I must do instead is either retire to Scotland and live on grass, which I cannot do, or I go to the front in France. He proposes another ambulance corps of Indians. And I shall serve the wounded Germans and the French as much as the English. Because by going closer to the battlefield, I too am putting my life at risk. And in doing so, I am cutting that chain of karma. Uh, I am making another kind of break in the chain of cause and effect uh, so that I don't benefit from and therefore perpetuate violence. I have done my duty by risking my own life without killing. All right. So in these ways, historians have often tried to make the case that Gandhi uh, was pro-British in his early career and he becomes disappointed with the empire only much later uh, and uh, that these are, you know, these acts, these activities are part of a career that was soon to winnow out. Uh, but in fact, I think something else is going on. Because though Gandhi seems to be operating in the kind of universal space of the British Empire and in support of it, his understanding of what he's doing and his reasoning is completely different. It has nothing to do with British war aims. Right? He has the same kind of argument when he returns to India again as the First World War is happening and the Viceroy calls for the recruitment of Indian soldiers, and Gandhi goes and tries to recruit soldiers for the British Indian Army. Again, an embarrassing uh, fact for many historians, but I think 
actually a very interesting one because Gandhi makes uh, uh, you know, uh, the following argument. He says, well, uh, not everyone believes in nonviolence as I do. Uh, and so my words have to appeal to different people in different ways. One of the appeals is the following. If we, the Indians, the civilian Indians, don't recruit these troops, they will be recruited by the British themselves. They will go into the army. When the war is over, you will have a large militarized contingent of Indian soldiers back who will be used against us by the British. If we recruit them, they will be responsible to us. We will have done so. We will immediately have snapped the bond between the military and the government by intruding the civilian nationalist leadership in between. So though it looks like it's a pro-imperial gesture to fight the war, in fact, it is breaking the logic of empire. But he doesn't stop there. He says, the war might also be a site where we can demonstrate the virtues of nonviolence. Because Gandhi, remember, was the apostle of nonviolence, but he was not a pacifist. He thought that wars sometimes became inevitable, but that, that wars themselves sometimes provided an opportunity for nonviolence. Uh, in this case, it was not a war that India had chosen, but it was one in which she fought. Uh, and if Indian soldiers could fight in such a way, in the way that Gandhi conducted his ambulance corps, as to serve all sides, to create a space for nonviolence, then something would have been done. Because when we think of violence and nonviolence in terms of war and peace, uh, that really doesn't work. Uh, it's not a comparison that works. Because war ends where peace begins, and peace ends where war begins. But for Gandhi, nonviolence is universal in this sense, that it is possible anywhere. It can, be, it can occur in the middle of a war, and it can occur in peacetime. So the categories war and peace don't actually make much sense for Gandhi in terms of thinking about nonviolence as a capacity that is possible everywhere and, and, at, and at all times. So both his ambulance corps and his, uh, um, his uh, recruitment of soldiers end up serving as reverse gifts. You know, the gifts that the British Empire gave its subjects was security within the umbrella of this maritime empire with its universal ethos, but a security defined entirely by the specificity of the colonized subject. They themselves could never aspire to universality. What Gandhi is trying to do is play off the universal and the particular in all the ways uh, that I've, been, I've trying to describe. So let me close by, if you could move to the next, why is it not? I guess we'll have to restart it. Anyway, we'll show you, I'll show you the pictures in a bit. This, of course, is Gandhi at the Dandi Salt March. Uh, his, um, so the Salt March and the Quit India Movement, 1930 and 1942, are you know, moments where Gandhi moves from the land to the sea in his, move, in his Satyagraha. Right here, he goes back to his native Gujarat to break the salt law and to collect salt from the sea. So he goes to the very borders of the putative territory of a sovereign and independent India. Um, 
and the Quit India movement, of course, is the same, where he wants to, the British to leave India in the same way they arrived by sea, all right? And there are all of these posters, famous posters from the time, which show the British, you know, these ships meant to be leaving India. Uh, so towards the end of his career, he actually, once he returns to India, the sea emerges in his work in, in these kinds of ways. You trek from the inside to the outs, to the very borders uh, of, of the country. Uh, and the sea also becomes an expression, the ex external expression of an inner struggle for Gandhi. When you read about what he says, whether he's uh, you know, on his journeys between London and South Africa or India and London, uh, you know, many of his experiments are occurring on board on, on deck, right? And I want to show you some of these. So this is a lovely pic. This is from Gandhi's trip to and from uh, the roundtable conferences in London. Uh, and there are lovely pictures of him on the ship. Uh, there he is with Mira Ben. Uh, and he performs his duties on deck. He spins, uh, uh, he you know, eats and drinks, he attends to his correspondence, etc. This is an unusual picture because um, you rarely see Gandhi looking directly at the camera and smiling in this way. And I think it's because uh, the man holding the baby is called Shoaib Qureshi and he was a Congress worker and that was his baby. And Gandhi was fascinated by small children. And there are other pictures of him dandling this baby you know, on that trip. And this baby is smiling as broadly as Gandhi is in, in this picture. The rest of these people are the Nawab of uh, Bhopal and his family. They were all going to London for the roundtable conferences. And Gandhi, if you look at his pictures, he tends not to look into the camera. Uh, and on film, he looks away. I think it's a very deliberate move on his part. Uh, but here he is on a deck chair, uh, smiling broadly. Uh, so I want to come to an end here. Um, uh, saying something about uh, his last few movements. Uh, I talked about the salt march, uh, which brings the land and the sea together, because you literally go to the sea to collect salt, right? Um, and the Quit India movement. Uh, but towards the end of his life, he says something very interesting in a piece of correspondence, which I shall read out, where he's describing the future of a free India. I think the battery has died. I'll uh, describe it to you. But you will have recognized this as a, an image from Gandhi's funeral, uh, locally made, very interesting. It's at the Triveni Sangam and you can see the three rivers personified, the Ganga, Jamna, and the Saraswati. They are receiving Gandhiji's uh, body, his ashes. And on the boat, the rivers flow out to sea. And on the boat are Pandit Nehru, and Sardar Patel, and Sarojini Naidu, and I think Molana Azad, and some others. Uh, it's a wonderful example of vernacular uh, art. Uh, it looks to be a photograph drawn over or, or painted over with planes. And you can see uh, uh, you know, all of this, and it, the river flows out to sea. So I wanted to end with that image, uh, because uh, Gandhi, in his last days, when he's thinking about what India is going to look like, uh, says the following. This is the structure which shall define it. In this structure, composed of innumerable villages, there will be ever widening, ever never ascending circles. Life will not be a pyramid with the apex sustained by the bottom, but it will be an oceanic circle whose center will be the individual always ready to perish for the village, the latter ready to perish for the circle of villages, till at the last the whole becomes one life composed of individuals, never aggressive in their arrogance, but ever humble, sharing the majesty of the oceanic circle of which they are integral units. What is he doing? He's comparing or contrasting the empire and ordinary polities to a, trying, to a pyramid. The pyramid is a symbol of royal power. It is also a symbol of death. A pharaoh is buried within. Right? A pyramid exists because of its base, 
but it is controlled from its top. That is not the kind of country Gandhi wants to see in India. The pyramid is a representation of land, of territory, and of control over territory. What does he contrast it with? What he calls an oceanic circle. So having struggled with the sea throughout his career, at the end of his life, he reclaims it. He reclaims it by going to the salt march to collect salt from the sea. He reclaims it in the Quit India movement, and he reclaims it in his words by saying, this is how the sea has come back onto land. But it is no longer the sea of the British Maritime Empire. This is the sea he conceives of India's territory itself in maritime terms. Villages, individuals in villages, groups of villages moving outwards, and it describes the move outwards from the individual to the village, to the group of villages, to the district and the region and the province, etc., all the way beyond the borders of India herself as a wave. It's an extraordinary image where a territory, a land, is seen in oceanic terms, and the process of democracy and freedom is understood or uh, imagined as a wave the wave of the ocean that flows out uh, and washes away um, all vestiges of colonial oppression. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir, for these words of wisdom. So from new ideas like two Englands, which cannot be separated, how they are interlinked, to a fascinating idea towards the end, which came in on uh, the recruitment that was done by Gandhiji during the war efforts, and the general notions or the general perspectives that how it was seen as a pro-British gesture that eventually the British would reward these experiences by giving uh, more concessions and more reforms to the Indians can be argued in a very different perspective, stating how it is trying to snap the connection of the colonial empire with the soldiers. That was truly fascinating. Uh, we are running a behind, bit behind schedule, but I'm sure there are so many students over here from right from the Somaya school to faculty members who are all students still learning, still absorbing so many facts. So I'm sure each and every one uh, present here has some questions, but we can take a few questions, which I'm sure uh, Professor Devji will be very good enough to answer. So uh, I'll request our student volunteers. Uh, you can just raise your hands in case the students have any questions or faculty members. Our student volunteers will hand you the mic. You can please raise your hand and in case there's any question, or any of the faculty members or dignitaries, in case you have a question to ask. Yes, yes. Uh, there's one over here. Please, your comment, please help. Good afternoon, sir. I am Priya from the Samaya School. I'm a faculty there. So, um, my question to you is like, what inspired this line of thinking? Because you're comparing Gandhiji's entire journey. And you know, with the whole theme of the various oceans and the, the the blurring of boundaries, basically. So, what inspired this line of thought? Like, did you read it somewhere, or did it come to you like while doing your research? Like, you know, what do you remember the starting point of this whole thought process? Because it's very interesting to think about it. Well, thank you very much. Um, I have, of course, been reading Gandhi for many, many years, uh, and I'd written my book on him. Uh, but I couldn't stop thinking about his work. And in a way, this is a very un-Gandhian thing to do, because Gandhi was against addiction of any kind, <laughs> whereas he himself inspires the greatest addiction. Because when you read someone like Gandhi, whether you agree with him or not, I don't always agree with him, but he, his prose, the muscularity of his prose, the spareness and the elegance of it, and the originality of the arguments are incredibly sed seductive. Um, so I kept on reading. Uh, and then it struck me that when you, when you read Gandhi's autobiography and some of his other writings, he rarely mentions in his childhood the sea. 
even though he's born in Porbandar, which is a major port for you know Gujarati traders and others to go across the Western Indian Ocean, uh, and when he recounts his uh, early life as a child, he the only time this cosmopolitan world of the Indian Ocean of Gujarat's position in this vast maritime space, which is not a colonial space comes when he describes his father's cosmopolitan gatherings. You know, he's meeting Parsi and Muslim friends and others, and they all discuss things uh, in these small, relatively small towns at the time. And it struck me that the sea was absent from Gandhi's memoirs of his own childhood, despite Gujarat's importance to them and the sea's importance to Gujarat, in a way precisely because it had become a kind of colonial arena. It was the site of empire. It made empire possible. And it allowed for a colonial understanding of its own universality. So Gandhi had to struggle to reabsorb or recover the sea, which is what I've, I tried to do in this talk. Um, and it's only much later in his career uh, that these maritime themes from his own voyages, not least, you know, come to play a role in all the ways that I've tried to describe, eating, uh, sexual relations, etc. Uh, so it made me very interested in thinking about how perceptions of and ex lived experiences of someone like him as a child and a young man really force us to think more carefully about things we routine, about things we take for granted, like Gujarat is part of a you know older maritime commerce and all the rest, uh, and so that was the initial motivation for me to think about this, and it takes many forms. You know, when you um, look at a title such as Hind Swaraj, Hind is a curious word to use. It's an Arabic word originally. Of course, the British used it in certain ways, such as Kaisar Hind, the medal was called Kaisar Hind. But it wasn't India. It wasn't, not that Gandhi didn't use the word. But when he labels his tract in Suraj, it puts you in mind of a different geography, a different cartography. This is not the map of the British Empire, painted pink, that you are thinking of when you read that title. All right? What is it? It has no defined boundaries. Uh, in a way, is part of another kind of cartography. But a lot of nationalists do that. You know, Nehru does it in the discovery of India when he describes India. It's a most beautiful metaphor. He says, India is that place where it rains, where the monsoons fall. So it's not territory. It's actually coming from above. Uh, and you, you can't think of a, 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 of a lovelier way of thinking, of, of imagining India. The place where it rains, the place where the two monsoons occur, that fruitful place, that is India. It literally drops from the heavens. Uh, and you therefore don't need to think about longitudes and latitudes and you know, things, borders and things like that. It's a civilizational way of thinking in some, in some fashion. So it is from these kinds of ways. It's from what, what I notice as a kind of curious absence in Gandhi that, I, you know, that made me try to track how he lived at sea, how he went to sea, and what he thought about it. Uh, but it's, it's work that remains, this is not published work, it's, uh, it's a set of thoughts which are more or less coherent. I have a question. <clears throat> you talked about um, England and India without the English, and that's not what we want to be, I mean, uh, uh, you didn't want the English systems without the English, you wanted to change. How does that inform us as we create an education system in India going forward? Well, that's a very big question, but it is one I suspect you are addressing uh, rather than I can. But, you know, in our own small ways, I mean, this is a question that animates, I think, many academics. Um, and that's one of the reasons, you know, I chose to become a historian. I should technically have been a merchant or a businessman or something by background. Uh, but I got interested in history in part because 
I, I felt that there was a disconnection, there was a disconnect between the kinds of things I had grown up being taught and what I read in books. Um, so it is not a question of trying to repudiate and reject everything that went under the name of colonialism. That is our inheritance as much as anything else. Uh, but in a way, just as I think Gandhi did, it's important to understand freedom not simply as something for oneself. It is always for others as well. And so just as Nehru thought that he would try to make England truer to its better self, Gandhi thought that India was a great experimental site in nonviolence. It was not the only one. For instance, the idea of satyagraha, it's an interesting term, it's a, no, it's a neologism, but he advertises in his newspaper, Indian Opinion, for a word, and people send in entries, such a democratic way of proceeding, and then he comes up with satyagraha. But his first example of satyagraha is of Boer women in British concentration camps in South Africa. It's not even to do anything with India. So even though it's a heavy duty Sanskritic term, it is not a purely Indian term. And for Gandhi, the experiment in nonviolence, if it succeeded in India, would succeed or could succeed everywhere in the world. Uh, and so in Hind Swaraj, for instance, he says in his, the dialogue with the revolutionary nationalists that you want uh, you know, uh, English rule without the Englishmen, and then he uses another metaphor, meaning you want the tiger's nature but not the tiger. Uh, and what you should want instead is nonviolence. And if the British adopt that, they're welcome to stay. Those who are in India, being Indian means being, in his view, nonviolent in all the many manifestations of that term. Anyone can do that. And those who are in India are Indians if they, are, if they subscribe to this. Uh, so it's a completely non-biological um, non understanding of being Indian, just as I was describing his attitude towards cow protection and cow slaughter as being non-biological. Uh, and all of which is to say, it's a circumvention of your question rather than a response to it, all of which is to say that the task to think differently about freedom um, and liberty necessarily involves others as much as ourselves, and it cannot be an example of another rivalry. You know, us against the West, or uh, that should not be how it is defined. And if we start that way, then I think we have some hope of uh, doing something really productive. So you mentioned about the pyramid and the oceanic circle. Of course, pyramid is a limited geometry, and the oceanic circle is a vast, endless humanity. Is it his, in, his view of... Uh, his seeing, is it Gandhi seeing or is it some Gandhi leaders or Gandhi's um, followers seeing this concept of pyramid and this oceanic circle? I think it's Gandhi himself because it's in a, in a, a letter by him or, uh, or is it a speech by him. So whether the term oceanic circle, I haven't seen it anywhere else. It may exist, and I might not yeah, know. Yeah, because that is even now very relevant, you know, this yes. the pyramid and... The oceanic circle. Yeah, but the pyramid, of course, is a classical, as you know. Yeah, limited geometry, yes, yeah. yes. And it's a classical symbol of power, authority, yes, you and order. Yes, yes. Uh, but the way in which Gandhi contrasts it with the ocean and with the oceanic circle. So he, he just interprets it. He does it, yes. Yeah, that's the yeah. point. Thank you for the uh, illuminating lecture. Thank you. Thank you. Just one student. Uh, good afternoon, sir. I'm Amstian Dukuna from TRVHT, SK Somaya College. So I have a question that, uh, can you please explain in brief about the Gandhi's on two England perspective, how, how he considers one England. As Nehru, in his book, Discovery of England, Discovery of India, considers that how England have two England. One is of John Stuart Mill and other is on slavery. So could you please explain in brief? 
Yeah, so basically Nehru thinks that, uh, you know, the thing about anti-colonialism, especially in India, is that it was a rarely, among the revolutionary nationalists, well, even among them in some ways, it was not anti-British or anti-Western uh, in any significant way. Um, therefore, Nehru thought we had a lot to learn from England, and Gandhi also thought that. Uh, and the revolutionary nationalists who were interested in using violence against colonial rule also, as Gandhi points out, want to become even more like the English, though Gandhi uh, criticized that desire. So in all of these cases, the relationship is a very intimate one, uh, which is somewhat paradoxical because you, we tend to think of colonial rule as being utterly alien. It is alien in one sense, uh, and in a liberal sense, that the, the liberal state in the West as well is meant to stand above society as a neutral third party, as an arbiter, there to mediate and manage the relations of its subjects. All right? Because it is removed from society, it is universal. It alone has the perspective to see all sides. Um, that is why justice is often in a, in a contradictory way because she doesn't see, she's blinded, right? She has a, a cloth over her eyes and that guarantees her neutrality, right? So she's not partisan. The liberal state is meant to be like that, but in, in being like that, it reduces its subjects to purely partial interest groups, either individually or collectively. Now, the colonial state, in Gandhi's view, was the purest form of, lib of the liberal state. Because in England itself, the state could not stand outside society completely. Because there were bonds of national identity and other such things. The queen or the king was also defender of the faith and represented the Church of England. In India, the state could assume this character. So in Gandhi's estimation, the colonial state is actually the purest form of the liberal state. And indeed, it justifies itself in this way by saying, it is precisely because we are foreign, because we are alien, that we can manage you. You cannot manage yourselves. You are too riven by your particularities. You fight with each other all the time. And we are standing above you. We are impartial. We are neutral. We can arbitrate. We can mediate. And Gandhi says, no. A, that's not true. B, even if it were true, it would be a recipe for despotism. Because that vision of constructing society is one which constantly empowers the state and disempowers individuals. Because they cannot relate each one to the other without going through a triangle. This is another pyramid, right? There's a state on top and the bases at the bottom. In order for one end of the triangle at the base to get to the other, you have to go through the top. And that's what courts and the state does. And so Gandhi in Hind Swaraj famously has this criticism of lawyers, doctors and lawyers, right? And he says about lawyers, look, they are not there to resolve quarrels. He's a lawyer himself, right? Uh, they are there as accredited representatives of the judicial system, which is a colonial institution. And they are there to prosecute uh, rather than resolve quarrels because quarrels between Indians uh, are not resolved by a court handing down the decision. That doesn't reconcile people. It simply means that the losing party is too afraid uh, to you know, trounce the winning party and violently claim his or her, uh, what they think of as their rights. Uh, that colonial justice works by dispossession and by fear. Uh, and what you need, and this is how the law works, you have to go through the courts and you can only therefore deal with your neighbors through the state in this pyramidical form. What Gandhi wants to do is to allow for ordinary people and communities and castes to deal with each other directly, without the mediation, without the triangle, without the pyramid. How do you do that? That is his big uh, problem. That is the problem he works with. And there are many ways in which he experiments with it. Very interestingly, so he refuses the kind of liberal logic 
of mediation, of contract, uh, of representation. He wants direct relations. And sometimes he thinks that even violence provides more opportunities for, for di such direct relations. When India and Pakistan go to war for the first time in 1948, Nehru takes the case to the United Nations famously. And Gandhi's against it. Gandhi says, no, the United Nations will simply act as another version of the colonial state. It will be a neutral third party there to judge between us. In the process, we lose all our initiative and agency. We lose all our moral integrity. Instead of which, it's better to fight. Because fighting allows for, it's a perverse perverted form of direct relations. It's perverted because the colonial state has disallowed us from relating to each other directly. Whereas he thinks Indian society in the past did, make, did allow that. And that these ways of acting and being are still available to us very widely. Because only a small section of India's population actually had any interactions with the state at all. In reality, people are dealing with each other all the time. Uh, and whatever they say or whatever they think their identities are, in fact, they live with each other. And Gandhi's statement, therefore, is, look, if people are capable of living with each other, it's not because they're afraid of the police. It's because they are nonviolent. Because everyday life, not wholly, but in large part, depends upon nonviolence. It cannot exist without nonviolence. How do you augment and increase these direct relations. Uh, and that's why he's a kind of anarchistic thinker in some way. It's not like he's against the state, but he wants to limit its reach. He wants to empower society uh, in this way. So it's another way in which he wants to collapse the pyramid into the ocean. Good afternoon, sir. Uh, I'm Abhijit from SK Sumer College. So my question is uh, from the beginning of your speech, elocution, that was the first stage of Gandhi, which is characterized by the interdict and his uh, negligence of the sexual relations. So uh, on his first voyage to London, as we know, the European and Western world is filled and packed up with all these temptations and all these illusions. But uh, Gandhi was successful to a great extent in controlling his urges in his first on his first voyage to london so if he could do so in london uh, then why there was a failure in towards the end of the independence when he decided to uh, in carrying out uh, the experiment of his the vow of his celibacy he decided to sleep with the opposite sex and to the extent that he decided to sleep with his uh, granddaughter Menuban, that which uh, who was 16 years old. So this is my question. Why thank, was thank you. I mean that of course is a, one of the major planks of a critique of Gandhi, and in his own lifetime, uh, many people from his own circle were very disturbed by this. Of course, he did not have sexual relations with these young women. Uh, uh, the the. He, he apparently was testing himself. He was already quite elderly by then. Uh, and he, the, the best account I've read of this is by Nir Nirmal Kumar Bose, who was an anthropologist who worked with Gandhi in Bengal and who left Gandhi on this matter. He actually left. But after Gandhi's assassination, he wrote a great deal about Gandhianism. And Bose basically writes that uh, he had confronted Gandhi about this. He writes that by that point in his life, Kasturba had died. Gandhi had become elevated as a Mahatma. He had no human relations with anyone. They all were genuflecting and bowing before him. Uh, and he was alone. His wife had died. Uh, he needed some grounding, you know, some directly human relations. Uh, and that is what he thought explains this experiment. Now, it doesn't tell us why Gandhi thought the way he did about it. Uh, but Bose's account seems to me to be perfectly, uh, to be uh, not just um, uh, viable as an account, uh, but indeed convincing as one. Uh, now, we, we shall have to wait to see Manubin, who is the young woman you refer to, wrote a diary 
uh, it is being translated at the moment by Tridip Sarood. Uh, so far, of course, it's available in Gujarati, uh, but it's called Bapu Mari Ma, uh, Father, My Mother. And it's called that because Manu Ben had been brought to take care of Kasturba, who was ill, and Kasturba died right, when they were imprisoned in Pune during the war. And then Gandhi takes Manu Ben into his guardianship, and he said to her, you came to serve Kasturba, you came to serve a mother. She has gone, I am now your mother. Treat me as your mother. So the gender relationship between Gandhi and Manu Ben is actually theoretically between two women rather than between a man and a woman, which of course con contradicts Gandhi's own statements about celibacy. Uh, but contradiction is perhaps not the right word. It's the complexity of the motivations and of the reflections on this matter, I think that is interesting and that requires uh, more study. So once Madhu Bain's diary is translated, scholars who don't know Gujarati will have much more to say about her view on this matter. And this, I shall end with this, because there's been a lot of criticism of Gandhi and his treatment of women, but two things need to be said here. One is that when you think about the women who enter Indian politics after her independence, the vast majority of them come through Gandhi and come through Gandhi's ashrams or are very close to Gandhi. Uh, whether it's um, Sarjana Naidu, of course, Sushila Nair, Rajkumari Amrit Kaur, um, Sucheta Kriplani, uh, there are any number of them, right? So Gandhi's, uh, activities and his ashrams serve as a kind of nursery for the making of women politicians and leaders. They are by no means unheard and oppressed people in his ashrams. The second thing is that the critics have never, to my knowledge, ever asked what these women themselves thought of what is happening, what happened with them or what they thought of Gandhi. And that is a kind of no, no feminist scholar would do that. You can't talk about how women are treated without asking what women thought. Uh, and that is what Manu Bain's diary, uh, when it appears, will hopefully allow us, will allow scholars to delve more deeply into these matters. Of course, we already have uh, the writings of others, such as Sushila Nair, who was Gandhi's doctor, became a minister in Nehru's cabinet. Hansa Mehta, you know, there are many such people who went to the United Nations. So I, I cannot have an adequate explanation for it, but these, um, this context hopefully is of some help. Yeah, I think this needs more explanation. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I know there are a few more questions, but due to the paucity of time, uh, it has May been. I? Uh, they can be an informal interaction, as uh, Professor Pillai has indicated. Sure. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Devji, for sharing so many invaluable insights on uh, such an engaging topic that we had uh, not heard before. Thank you, thank you so much. Uh, our gratitude uh, to the Somaya management, to Somaya Vidya Vihar University, the entire Vidya Vihar family. Uh, Professor Ganesh Devi sir is here as uh, leader of the School of uh, Civilization, uh, under whom uh, we have been organizing this particular Somaya public lecture. The final remarks uh, for today's session will be delivered by our Chancellor for Somaya Vidya Vihar University and the President of Somaya Vidya Vihar. And with Chancellor's words, we'll draw to a close to tonight, today's session. I'll request uh, Shri Samir Somaya, sir, to kindly deliver the closing remarks for today's session. One word. I want to thank him. Um, I just want to make a statement that this campus itself, um, the founder was very inspired by Gandhiji, my grandfather. Um, I can only recount one thing, and I don't, I mean, I was not alive. This is in the 20s. But Gandhiji was imprisoned, 
and my grandfather felt as a, he was a young man in his 20s, that uh, how can he suffer for our freedom? And we just try to hope that we get free by his work. So I should also suffer with him. And he decided at that day that he would fast and take maun, which is not speak, one day in a week <clears throat> for the rest of his life. And um, I was born in 1968 when he was 66 years old. He died when he was 97. And I saw him observe that fast. And he continued to observe it uh, for his whole life. And so I think it is, a, I mean, and even this campus that he created, which he built in a, uh, in a spirit, of, spirit of trusteeship, that if you earn uh, Shatahasta Samahara Sahasra Hasta Sankir, earn with a hundred and give with a thousand. And that um, I still remember when he would come here, he would not take food uh, from the campus because he said that Dan me de diya hai to yahan se paani bhi nahi peena chahiye. And I think that is an amazing example of lived trusteeship that we saw. And so Gandhiji made a big influence on people like my grandfather, plenty of people who decided to give back to society. And I think we need to keep continuing the tradition of a man who really showed a nice way. Uh, thank you for coming here. He speaks, he's from Tanzania, born in Tanzania, educated in Canada, worked in the US and now in the UK. Uh, uh, similarly, my grandfather's grandfather, or from my father's side, because we also have mother's sides and we couldn't, we should not forget that, but for a moment I'll talk about my dada's dada who left Kutch and, and came to Mumbai, so, and have lived here for a long time. But Ipan Kachi Bolata, Aupan Kachi Bolanto, Asi Kach Gana Vare Pala Chadivai, but the Kachi diaspora, the Kachi language lives within us, and uh, we hope it continues to do so. So thank you very much. Yes.